Well, I'm excited about uh, continuing our study. If I don't know you, my name is Josh Barnett. I'm the youth pastor here uh, on staff, and uh, Tim and Paul and I have been doing this James uh, series that we're going to get into tonight. And uh, as we start this, this is actually kind of a difficult part of the text that we're going to be getting into tonight. And so uh, uh, a couple things that I want to um, share. Um, Number one, you're forgiven. That's good news. (laughs) You're forgiven, and it's not because of anything that you've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Um, He loves you more than you can imagine. Praise God. Thank you for your love. Um, And then the last thing, um, he likes you. He likes you. He not only loves you, he likes you. And he likes you wherever you're at. He likes you in the process right now. (laughs) He, He actually desires to be close to you. He actually gets down in our mess with us. Um, And and I I don't know, I think somebody needed to hear that tonight, that he's with you and he's, he's never walking out on you. And he'll sit with you in your mess as long as you're there. And, uh, and he'll be waiting to walk out with you. Um, He enjoys you. He enjoys your company. So now let's go to James chapter (laughs) 2. Uh, James chapter 2, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week in verse 14. We're going to go verse 14 through verse 26. This is a very popular text, but can be a difficult one to understand in light of other scriptures in the New Testament, and we're going to look at that tonight. Uh, There is a, there's a big tension in this, in these verses that we're going to read. Actually, this is a very debated over passage of scripture of like, what does it mean and what does it not mean? Um, Martin Luther was actually a fan of leaving it out of the New Testament altogether. He didn't, he wasn't super crazy about it. Um, but so we're going to read it and discuss it and, uh, and talk about what, uh, James is actually trying to teach us here and how it actually does go along with the rest of the New Testament. James chapter one, verse two, uh, uh, I'm sorry, James chapter two, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith and others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. If you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as scripture says, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteousness because of his, righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. So as soon as we read that, as soon as we start going through that, I think the legalistic side of us can rise up and go, all right then, like give me the list of what I need to do. Like, give me the list of the 25 things that I need to do to be a Christian. Give me the list that I need, the do's and don'ts of Christianity. Like, what are the works? What are the good deeds that I'm supposed to do? And just let me help you out. That, that thinking is not right. That's not what James is trying to show us at all tonight. It's, not a, it's, it's technically not about what you do and what you don't do. It's about what he did and about who he says you are. We must know that... that <laughs> That it's not salvation and then a to-do list. It's not something that, salvation is not something that you work to keep. It's not like get saved and now, okay, now you have a to-do list. It's like get saved and now we get to work. That's not at all what James is talking about here. James is not arguing over what works are in this passage. He's arguing what real faith is. 
And I, I want to make it clear as we start this at the front that we are not saved by our works. We are saved by faith. Ephesians 2, Paul writes, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So it's by grace alone, through faith alone, that we have been saved. Not by anything that we've done. Salvation can never be earned. It's only given. And now that, now that was written by Paul. And so like you read Paul and then you go, okay, then what is James talking about? And so it's like, so you got the apostle Paul and the apostle James. And at first glance, it's like, man, these guys are going against each other. Like these guys are butting heads. So I want to break this down. James versus Paul round one tonight. Um, but they're, they're not competing against They're not competing. They're complimenting. They're not competing against each other, they're complimenting. What they do together is they bring us a fuller, clearer picture of real faith, of good works, and of what salvation really is. And if you just read the next verse, because a lot of people like to stop there, if you just read the next verse, verse 10 in Ephesians, Paul says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul and James are not working against each other, but rather bringing a tension together. They definitely agree. They definitely agree. What Paul was, Paul was the, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. His mission was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And what he was very adamant about, if you read his teachings, if you read his letters, is he did not want the Gentiles to fall into believing that they had to follow the Torah, that they had to follow the law to be saved. He was very adamant that we're not, we're not putting these guys into a Jewish law. We're not making them follow their, our customs. We're not making them get circumcised. We're not making them follow these festivals. We're not being legalistic about this because that's not what it's about. Those things don't save us. Jesus Christ saves us. And Paul was very adamant about that. But then you've, you've got James, who was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And so he mainly has Jews in his, in his uh, congregation, right? And so the Jews are like going off in like the other ditch and like, well, we don't have to do anything at all. And so you've got Paul with this, with this ditch and you've got James with this ditch and they're bringing it together so that we can fully understand in the New Testament. And it's exactly what Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 6. He says, for when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. So there's your good work right there. Faith expressing itself in love. In, a, in Romans chapter 3, verse 27, 28, it almost seems like we have another contradiction because Paul says, can we boast then that we have not done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. And a lot of people that would want to argue, like, you know, it's, you, it's just faith alone and it's nothing else. Like, just, not, like, doesn't matter, like, all grace, all faith, like, nothing, nothing else. Well, he goes on to say, in verse 29 through 31, he says, After all, God is the God of the Jews. Is he the God of the Jews only? Isn't he the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. There's only one God, and he makes people right with him only by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well, then, if we emphasize faith, does that mean we forget about the law? And he says with exclamation point, of course not. Just because you're saved by faith alone doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want to do. Because he says, in fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Paul shows us that it's by faith that we can truly fulfill the law. Fulfill the law. Obey God. Love him. Love his people. All right, last one. Can I do one more? Is that okay? I'm, I like this. I don't know if you're enjoying this, but I, this is fun for me. Second Timothy, I mean, not Second Timothy, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians Chapter 5, verses 14 through 17 says, Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to ourselves, our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely, merely from a human point of view a point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new has 
begun. And so what Paul and James both know is that when the word of truth pierces our heart, when salvation, when we truly understand salvation, we fully put our faith in Christ alone, transformation takes place. Transformation actually takes place. And James is, what James is trying to get across to us is that if there's no transformation, there's no salvation. If there's no transformation, there's no salvation. And that's what James is trying to bring to a point here. So James didn't contradict the apostle Paul. James merely is clarifying to us what kind of faith saves. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works, but saving faith will have works accompany it. And if you, if you get anything that, you, that I'm saying at all tonight, everybody listen to this one point. This is the whole point. I could say this and we could just say amen and go home, all right? Faith alone saves, but faith that saves is not alone. It has good works with it. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. It has good works with it. So the hard thing that James is is tackling here is he's trying to, in our minds and in our hearts, marry faith and works together and show us that true faith and and good works are not separate from each other, that they actually go together. He is saying that faith alone saves, but he's saying it's a certain kind of faith. It's a real faith. It's a genuine faith. It's a faith that produces good works, that produces good works. James is not arguing that works must be added to faith. We don't get saved to get to work on our works. He would be arguing then that we would actually still be enslaved to the law. He'd be arguing that the cross didn't mean anything. We've got to know that Jesus fulfilled the law. He did the ultimate work that saved us and sanctified us. He's arguing that genuine biblical faith will inevitably inevitably be characterized by works. So let's define what faith is. Let's define what faith is. Faith simply is this, trusting and obeying God. Simply, the faith that James is talking about is trusting and obeying God. Faith is believing that God is who he says he is and that he's gonna do what he said he was gonna do. That's what faith is. It's trust and obedience to God because you believe he is who he says he is and he's gonna do what he said he was gonna do. Well, then what is works? What it, when James says works, what is he talking about? Is he talking about the law? Is he talking about the Torah? What's he talking about? Works, simply put, for all of us, always needs to be loving God and loving others. That's what it is. That's what works is. It's loving God and loving others. Matthew chapter 22. And if, you, if, you'll, if you'll read the teachings of Jesus and then you read James, it's like he's just saying what Jesus said in a different way is all he's doing. It's just like you read the Sermon on the Mount and then you go read James. It's like, okay, James, you're, you're just repeating your brother. Um, Matthew 22, verse 30, uh, 35 through 40 um, says that an expert in religious law was going to trap him with a question. He says, teacher, what is the most important, important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire, and he ends it with this, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So everything Jesus says, sum it up. Love God, love people. That's as simple as he could make it. And that's a true faith will cause you to love God and love people. That's what it really is. All the law hangs on these, okay? Well, you know, well, how do you love God? How would I show that? How do I show God that I love him? You pursue him. You go after a relationship with him. You, you obey him. You surrender to him. And, and if you love God with all that you are, like he's saying here, then actually loving your neighbor as yourself will be a byproduct of loving God. If you'll focus on number one, number two will actually happen. Because you can't get close to God and not get his heart for his people. Right? And, and Paul was talking about a couple weeks ago, that even those people that like annoy you, those hard people in your life, but if, you, if you'll get close to God, he'll put his love in your heart for that person and you will love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Everybody. Not the person that lives across the street from you, not the person that lives next to you. All, everyone across the world is your neighbor, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what they believe, regardless of how they vote, regardless of whatever, their financial status, Anything, it, your neighbor is everyone and you're supposed to love everyone just like you love yourself because when you, when you love that person like you love yourself, your 
reflecting, like we're supposed to be image bearers of God and reflecting his love to people all across the world, to everybody that we come in contact with. <clears throat> and, you know, I'll say this. Um, God is not looking for you to be perfect in this area. He's looking for progress. He's looking for progress. Can, <laughs> so show of hands, like, who loved God and everybody around you perfectly this week? <laughs> Nobody, anybody raise their hand, then you can check off like, thou shalt not lie, like you blew that one, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like, listen, like, none of us in here love God like, like we 100% should have this week, and none of us loved people, and that's the really hard one, love people like 100% we should have this week, Right? And so God's not looking for you to be perfect. He's looking for progress. He's looking like, are you, are you trying to do these things? Do you, do you have a desire to do these things? That's what he is. That's what he's looking for. <laughs> so because of that, there's no way we could argue that we have to add works to our faith to save us because we cannot save ourselves. There's no way that we can love God and love people perfectly. Only one person did that. And his name was Jesus. Jesus. And he fulfilled that. And now he empowers us, his grace empowers us to do that. Do we fall short? Yes. But the goal is to get better and better and better and better at it. And listen, it's, that's not like a heavy, if that feels heavy to you of like, oh, I gotta get better at loving God and loving people. It, maybe it's because you don't understand that he did it perfectly so that you wouldn't have to. Because if you would have to do those things perfectly, then we needed to nail you to the cross. <laughs> the, tracking with me? Okay. <laughs> Instead, we have genuine, real faith in God. When we have that, our works begin to stem from our faith. Real faith leads to good works. Real faith leads to an ongoing, growing love for God and for others. Works do not add to our faith or create our faith or save us. But a faith that produces good works is a real saving faith. James in this text is, is proving that real faith includes good works. And he does it by pointing out three things. So if you're taking notes tonight, he does it by pointing out three things. Number one, faith without works is useless. Faith without works is useless. You see it in verses 14 through 17. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food and no clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. So you see, faith by itself isn't good unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. So he, so he sets up the situation, like if you see somebody in need, and like you don't you see a brother in need and you don't do anything about it. That's useless. That's useless. So like what kind of faith, like what kind of faith do you have? And, and listen, <laughs> he's, he, he's talking about like a Christian brother or sister who's like fallen on hard times. Fallen on hard times that we would feel compassion for our family and we would reach out and help. But it would be like, <laughs> it would be like, um, I don't know, just somehow somebody that you know falling on hard times and them telling you about it and you're just like, all right, well, God bless you. Have a great day. Like, what? Like, that's, that is not what we are called to do. It's like saying, like, cool, like, hope it works out for you, buddy. No, like, if it's your brother or sister in Christ, like, then we, then we should, there's a love in us that should reach out and want to help them want to help them. Actually, uh, I, heard, I heard a thing earlier today that, that the New Testament church, if they heard that they had a, a Christian brother or sister who was hungry, who, was, who, who didn't have money to buy food, that they themselves would give up food and save their money day to day so that they could buy that person food. They would go on a fast. That's incredible. Right, so it's, it's, this, it's this place that we get where we want to help our brothers and sisters who are in need, and if we don't do that, then our faith, James is saying that our faith is useless. It helps no one. We've got to know we have not been blessed by God just to make our lives better. Now, that's not a bad thing, but we've got to know we are primarily blessed by God to be a blessing to other people. When you have true, 
saving faith, you love God and you love his people, and you use what you've been blessed with to help those around you to build the kingdom. And all James is doing here is he's mirroring the teaching of Jesus found in James, uh, sorry, mirroring the teach, teaching of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus says, I was, I was hungry and you didn't give me anything to, to eat. I was thirsty and you didn't clothe me. I was, right? And like, the, Jesus, when do we see you like that? And he said, whenever you saw your brother and sister in need and you didn't do it for me, didn't do it for them, you also didn't do it for me. And so James is mirroring what, what Jesus taught there. I, I, I love Tim's testimony um, about how he got, about how he got uh, hooked up with Alvin in uh, Honduras, our missionary in Honduras, because uh, a hurricane hit Honduras and it, he just broke his heart for these people. He just saw this devastation going on in Honduras and he wanted to do, you, you know, something to help out. And so what James is saying, the equivalent of, of that would be like, you know, Tim seeing that hurricane, all that devastation, hit, and then him just going, well, man, God bless those people. Hope somebody helps them. No, Tim was moved with compassion because he has real, genuine faith. And he went, did, had no idea what he was doing, just went and bought a plane ticket, flew down to Honduras and met Alvin. And we've been doing, we've been supporting Alvin for like 20-something years. Crazy. Faith without works is useless to everyone. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help God. It doesn't help anyone around you. Works of loving service are not... Um, a subtitle, but they're rather verification of our faith in Jesus. They're not just like, they're, they're not just like part of it. Like they verify that we do have faith in Christ. Faith without works is useless to the one in need. And it's actually, faith without works is useless to the one who has much. Like I want to, I want to, I want to say this to you tonight. Like faith without works is useless to the one who has much because how much does it do in our hearts when we're generous to other people? Like God wants to do something in us and through us. And like when we are not being a conduit for his blessing, like how much of God's love and generosity are we missing out on? And any, if you've ever given anything away, like if you've ever sacrificed for other people, like if you've ever helped someone in any way, like you know, like, wow, does it not bring you to life? It's like you find out what you are made for whenever you're generous. But if, we don't have works, then it's also useless to the person who has that as well. Number two, number one, faith without works is useless. Number two, faith without works cannot save. Faith without works cannot save. If you go to verse 18, he says, now some may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in fear. How foolish can you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Let's pause right here. James sets up a, a hypothetical argument here with someone to like prove his point. It actually would have been funny if this was like somebody actually like told him this in his church and then he was like, let's just say that someone said, but it's like you really know like it's Bill that said that, right? <laughs> It's kind of funny, right? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, like Paul's up here preaching and like he's saying something I'm like, dude, just, man, that was me. You just met with me about that yesterday and now you're telling everybody about it. You ever felt that way? No, just me? Okay. <laughs> but I feel like that's what James is doing here is like, you know, you, that guy just said that to you yesterday and now you're writing it down and now everybody's gonna know that y'all argued about it. Uh, but he's saying, like someone would say, you have faith and I have works, but James makes the point here that works prove our faith. Because um, he's saying like, okay, you say you just have faith, okay? Well, then show me. Like, show me. Don't let it be this ambiguous thing. Like, show me that you have faith. And one example that, I, that I, I've seen a few people use is like the example of, of a chair. How do you know that the chair will hold you? You sit down in it. Right? You sit down in the chair. Uh, so uh, at our house, uh, my wife has this, um, I don't, does anybody other, like anybody else's wives like buy old chairs and paint them and like put them in the corner of a house? My wife did that with a chair. That chair is like, the rule is like, don't sit on that chair because it won't hold you. <laughs> like, right? Like I have no faith in that chair because it will break. It's, that chair is decoration. 
I thought you made chairs to, to you know, to sit in them, but like, no, like that one is, that one's decoration, don't sit in that chair, because um, it will definitely break. But like everyone came in here tonight and you had faith in your chair that it was gonna hold you, right? Because it's made of steel, it's like bolted to concrete. Like you knew, without a doubt, you sat down in that chair because you knew it would hold you. And what James is saying in this argument is for you to say like, I believe this chair will hold me. And he's saying, okay, sit. And he's like, no, I, I know that it will. I know that it will hold me, but I don't want to sit down. I want to stand. And James is saying like, no, like show me that you have faith in that chair. Just, just sit in it, right? And it's like, no, like, you know, I don't. <laughs> Had bad experience with chairs before. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what James, it's simple, like have a seat. Have a seat, right? You believe, that chair, you believe that chair will hold you, like good for you. Even demons believe that. Right? But they don't have a seat. Have a seat. That's how you prove that you believe the chair will hold you. <clears throat> so we've got to understand that intellectual agreement that God is real is not real faith. right? Intellectual agreement that God is real, that is not faith. That's not the faith that, that James is talking about here. <laughs> it's putting our trust in God. It's going all in on him. It's turning our lives over to him. <laughs> Intellectual assent to correct doctrine is not salvation. Be you can believe all of the right things about God and not be saved. The demons believe all the right things about God, and guess what? They are not saved. You can believe all of the right things. You can have this Bible memorized, and you can have the coldest, hardest heart far away from God. Intellectually agreeing that he is real does not bring you salvation. It is not faith. If there is not real love for God or for people, then I would say there is no salvation. And again, not perfect love, not that you got all your stuff together, but progress in love and progress in relationship. Just like believing that the chair will hold me and never sitting in it, it's like believing that God is real but never surrendering, surrendering my life to his lordship. Faith alone saves you, but it's not faith that is alone. Works are a part of real faith. Okay, let's continue in this section here. Verse 20. I'm sorry, verse 21. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. So he uses two examples here from scripture to prove his point. Two examples. Number one, no surprise, right? Abraham. Abraham, he's the father of Israel, like he's the father of the nation, like father Abraham, many sons, many sons had father Abraham, I'm one of them. Yeah, if you were raised in church, you'd, yeah, you could sing, you could just sing it with me right now, like, um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it, it's super lame, so it's okay, <laughs> super lame. There are some songs that my kids will never learn that I had to endure as a child. <laughs> Abraham, no, he's, he's a father of Israel, he's a, he is the friend of God, but, but he himself had to prove his faith in God by his obedience. He had to prove his faith in God by his obedience. It, his obedience revealed that he trusted God. He revealed that he trusted God by sitting down, by sitting in the chair. Like, and trusted God to the point of that it was gonna cost his son's life. Like, that's huge. Like, I'm the father of many nations. I've been waiting on this boy for 25 years, and he finally gets here. He, start, he starts growing up, and now you want me to go kill him. Abraham never questions God. 
Not out loud anyway. We never see any. He just goes up the mountain. Goes up the mountain. And if you, if you go to Hebrews 11, it basically says that Abraham, like re, Abraham reasoned in his mind that, that God was going to raise Isaac back to life. And so he was sold out to God. Whatever God told him to do, like I'm going. Like that, that is, that's crazy awesome faith. But he's saying, James is saying he was proved to be right with God because of his obedience, because of what he did. He trusted God. He took the promise, he took the dream, and he laid it on the altar. And I don't believe that God stopped him until there was no going back. The angel, like, obviously he didn't kill his son, but for three days in Abraham's mind, Isaac was dead. But Abraham, Abraham's not a big surprise. Like, he's, you know, he's going to be used quite a bit. Like, especially, you know, James is the pastor of the Jewish church in Jerusalem. Like, he's just full of Messianic Jews. Like, yeah, Abraham, like, we love Abraham. Like, he's the man. Then number two, though, number two, I love that he uses Rahab. I love that he uses Rahab. The prostitute, the pagan, the Gentile. Not only is she not Jewish, but she's a pagan prostitute. And listen, like, I, I think it's sometimes it's so easy to just, I think it's so easy, I think it's so easy for us to become legalistic and, and think like, man, that person is really, really, really screwed up. And we don't see people the way that God sees them. And I'm talking about myself too. It's, you know, it's so much easier to read about Abraham than it is a prostitute. But I will say this tonight, that no little girl grows up dreaming about being a prostitute. It happens because of horrible, demonic, evil abuse of her and to the point where she has no value for herself anymore. And I just think about like how lowly she must have been viewed. And just think about the awful things that she has to endure but in the life that she's living but but I, I just you know I just picture her like in Jericho like here and like there's a people coming and they serve this God and maybe he can set me free because I've been hearing about all the wonderful things that he's doing and everybody else is scared but I'm thinking man there's freedom here and I just see that like stirring up in her heart where she's thinking like, maybe he can get me out of this. And it's not a huge step like Abraham. Like Abraham had a sacrifice. Like she basically, she hid these two guys in her house. And then she had to like, just lay a, like a strand out of her window so they know where she was. That's all she did. That's all she, she didn't have to like sacrifice her son. It's just like a small step. <laughs> And like, I want you to know tonight, like, no, no matter where you're at, like, it's just a small step. It's just a small step. I think some of us, you know, even when we read this, like, we're waiting on, like, Josh, like, get to the list of works, get to the things that I need to do to add to my faith tonight. But how simple was Rahab obedience and how messed up of a life did she have? But because of her small steps, she was saved. And faith without works cannot save. If she did not make that small step, she would have not been saved. And guess what? She is in the lineage of Jesus. She's the ancestor of our Savior. It's incredible. She's a part of, she's a part of our family. God will save anyone. All they have to do is just simply trust, just take that small step. And, man, I was thinking about this tonight. Like, you take that small step, and, like, he's coming with an army. And he doesn't care what you're bound by. He's coming. He doesn't care what fortified city you live in. You take a small step towards him, and he's coming to set you free. That is grace. 
That is what grace is, is that he's coming to loose you from whatever you're bound to. He's coming to set you free forever. <laughs> Papa's on the way. <laughs> there's, this, uh, there's this movie, uh, I don't know if you've seen it or not, there's this movie, uh, I think it's on Netflix and Prime and all kind of stuff, so you could easily watch it, but it's called The Heart of Man, and I always show it to our interns and our, our high school students, and uh, it, it's about like our sexual brokenness and and uh, the father heart of God, and, and it shows like a reenactment of the prodigal son story, and the son like runs away, and he, uh, he like has this relationship with this woman, and then he gets trapped in this cave by like this demonic guy, and then uh, he just calls out for help, and like his dad comes. It is, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna fall apart. It's just so amazing, because like every time he like steps up, like he, and, and the father comes, I just weep, like it's so his grace is so, how beautiful is the gospel of Jesus? <sighs> and James shows us the simple gospel of putting our faith in God, and he shows it on two opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Like the one who grew up following God, and the one who grew up far away from God. The one who grew up knowing, knowing everything about God, and the one who grew up knowing nothing about God. The one who grew up hearing about God and seeing God move, and the one who grew up a life full of of abuse and depravity. And what I want you to see tonight is both were in need of salvation. Now, like it doesn't matter if you were raised in church, you got the whole Bible memorized, you still need Jesus. Just like the atheist needs Jesus. Your family drug you to church, you've been here every time the doors open, right? You got this whole, you could preach this better than I could, you still need Jesus. Just like the prostitute still needs Jesus, just like the Muslim still needs Jesus. We all need Jesus. We're both in need of a faith that saves. All right, number three. I've got two minutes. It's y'all's fault. I just, y'all are holding me up. Number three, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. It's useless. It cannot save. Number three, faith without works is dead. He says it twice. He says it in verse 26 and verse 17. And he's saying that faith without works is no faith at all. Just like you are not alive without breath, neither is faith alive without works. A Christian with real faith in their life is going to produce fruit. We're going to produce things. Real faith is going to produce good works. Where there is no fruit, there is no faith. So do a fruit check. <laughs> do a fruit. Well, how do I check my fruit? Let's start with the fruit of the Spirit. Do you love? Do you have joy? Do you have peace? Do you have patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? That's a good place to start on my fruit check. <laughs> Are you reflecting the image of God? Are you making disciples? And, and, and listen, we, we've got to know, just like a tree, we don't get our life from our fruit. We don't get our life from our fruit. Where do we get our life from? Where do trees get their life from? They get them from their roots. The roots produce the fruit. The faith produce good works. If you're not bearing fruit, it's not that you have a fruit problem. It's that you have a faith problem. It's that you have a root problem. Psalms chapter 1 says, a tree, uh, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, standing around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season their leaves never wither and all and they prosper in all they do where are you planted where was the tree planted planted by the streams who's the stream jesus jesus i'm going to end with this turn to uh because i'm out of time turn to john 15 favorite chapter in the whole bible <laughs> if i could have one chapter it would probably be this Verse 1, I'm reading from the Passion Translation because I love the way that it words it. It says, I am a true sprouting vine. This is Jesus talking. And the father who tends the vine, and the, the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words I have spoken over you have already cleansed you. So you must remain in life union with me. 
Most translations say, abide in me or remain in me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from a vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I am the sprouting vine, you're my branches. As you live in union with me, as your source, fruitfulness will stem from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. If a person who is separated from me, he'll be discarded. Such branches are gathered up, thrown into the fire to be burned. But if you have life union with me, and if my words live powerfully in you, then you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be done. When your life when your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are mature disciples who glorify my Father. I love each one of you this, with the same love that the Father loves me. Wow. You must continually let my love nourish your heart. If you keep my commands, you will live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, for I continually live, nourish, and empower his love. He goes on. So good. Read the rest of it later. But with Jesus saying, abide in me, remain in me, plant yourself in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you stay in me, you'll produce fruit. If you have real faith, if you put it in me, you'll have good works. It's just a natural byproduct. It all comes from our relationship with Jesus. So to end, faith is our trust and belief in God. Works are our obedience. You cannot have one without the other. If you trust and believe in God, then you're going to obey him. James is not saying that faith alone doesn't save us. He's saying that if we have faith, true faith in God, then obedience will be a natural byproduct. Y'all stand with me. Let's pray here tonight as we dismiss. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that it penetrates every part of who we are. We thank you for this gospel that we have. We thank you for the good news of the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that the kingdom is at hand, that love and peace and joy are available to us right now, that righteousness is available to us right now, not because of anything that we did, but because of everything that you did, Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would just stir up a desire in our hearts. Stir up a desire for you, God. Maybe as I was speaking tonight, maybe there's, there's some in here that would say, man, I, I, I want to love God, but I don't. I ask that you would put that desire in their hearts right now, that you would stir up their affections for you, Jesus. Stir up their affection for you, Jesus, right now, that you would touch their hearts, God. You would touch their hearts with your love, that they would feel you, Lord, that they would feel your nearness, and your closeness. And Lord, for maybe there's some in here that say, you, like, I don't desire God, don't want to. Holy Spirit, you're the only one that can reveal truth to the heart of man. Lord, I ask that you would just open them up. I ask that you would break hardness of, off of hearts, Lord. Help us to not be a legalistic and religious people. Help us to see our neighbors the way that you see them, Lord. Teach us, Lord, how to bring this gospel message of the kingdom to everyone that we come in contact with. May we reflect your glory. May we reflect your goodness. Lord, help us bring that tension together in our hearts and our minds that faith without works is useless, that it cannot save, that it's dead. Show us what true, real, genuine faith is. Lord, teach us to be seated with you in heavenly places. Lord, you said that we are co-seated with Christ in heavenly places. Teach us how to sit down. Teach us how to trust in you. Lord, if we sit down, then the obedience comes natural. If we sit with you, the fruit becomes natural. Don't let us be fruit conscious. Let us be root conscious. Lord, we love you so much. Lord, I ask that your hand of protection and health, healing, would be on our congregation, would be on our body, God, that, that, that this body of Christian ministers, this, this part of the body of Christ would walk in health, would walk in blessing, God, like to the point that we bring health and blessing to other people. Lord, may we shine bright in this community. May we shine bright in hot springs. May we shine bright in Arkansas. God, we love you. We're so grateful to you. 
Lord, we give you all that we are tonight. We surrender to you. Go before us this week. Lead us, guide us, direct us. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you so much. Have a great week.